find that out. Other cancers have a strong genetic uh, connection. We were talking about, what were we talking about? Oh, we were talking about individuals that have a genetic proclivity for cancers. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture of the uh, Jolie family. Uh, and as we will see, uh, the Jolie family has a lot of cancer in their family. And this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, Angelina Jolie has had a hysterectomy and why she's had a double mastectomy. There are select groups of individuals that have an ancestry of cancer. They're, it's in their family. The Ashkenazi Jews, as I was explaining last time, has uh, a history of breast and ovarian cancer. This is very common, uh, especially among Europeans. Uh, other cancers that have a strong genetic connection, basal cell carcinoma. Uh, it's uh, common localized skin cancer. This is, this is a basal cell carcinoma right here. Um, I've had three of them chopped off my body. Uh, but I'm white, so <coughs> white people have a proclivity for uh, skin cancer. So the paler you are, the more skin cancer that you have. My mother was a redhead, and she had freckles. And she, like every time she went in to see the dermatologist, he chopped something off of her. Poor thing. Kind of felt sorry for her. Of course, it didn't bother her. She just swore a lot, so it made her feel better to swear. <laughs> My mother swore like a sailor. Ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, laryngeal cancer. Uh, individuals, um, this will run in families. Uh, so one, uh, one individual in the family has pancreatic cancer, or one individual has prostate cancer, one of the males has prostate cancer. This runs in, uh, all, of, all of his boys will potentially have prostate cancer. Uh, the other problem that we have is uh, uh, chemicals. Um, chemicals that are supposed to clean your, your table. Uh, chemicals that are supposed to kill all the insects in the, uh, along the baseboards. Uh, these chemicals are toxins, and some of sometimes they're pathogens. So, which would what would you rather have? Would you rather have dirt on your? Would you rather have bacteria on your tables, or would you rather have cancer? It's your choice. What did we choose? Cancer or, or bacteria? Some people put the, the clean things with antibacterial. Um, substances all the time. And what they're doing is they're setting up a, a, a carcinogenic uh, atmosphere for their children. Despite the fact they think they're keeping their children safe, the reality is they're, they're creating a, a cancer-filled, uh, pot, possibly a cancer-filled environment for their children. <clears throat> all these antibacterial everythings. You have antibacterial soaps. You have antibacterial, you've got Listerine uh, that kills all the bacteria in your mouth, which is okay. We can kill all the bacteria in our mouths. Uh, do we really want to kill all the bacteria on our hands? Do we want to kill all the bacteria on our feet? What's the probability we're going to get an infection in our hands just because we touch the wrong thing? Not really. As a matter of fact, the bacteria on our hands protect us from the bad bacteria. The, the benign bacteria protect us from the malignant bacteria, from the pathogenic bacteria. So antibacterial things are not a good idea. <coughs> you don't want to eat the, you don't want to eat feces, of course, but at the same time, you certainly don't want to kill all the bacteria. I'm sorry, that's the way it works. Let your kid go out and eat dirt. That's okay. It's fine. Dirt is okay. <laughs> Everybody gets dirt in their mouth at one time or another. I used to play mud volleyball. This was up in Montana. I played mud volleyball. You, we got splashed in the mouth. You get all this dirt in your mouth. You're drinking all this dirty, muddy water. You know, you die for the ball. And you slide in the mud, comes up in your face, get a mouthful of mud. I'm not dead yet, okay? And, and I didn't get sick because of all that dirt. Uh, so there's lots of bad chemicals out there. Um, 
There is no subfield of cancer that has been identified as many uh, new toxins. Asbestos is, is poison, we know that. It causes uh, lung cancer. Uh, vinyl chloride. Arsenic. You're back. Okay. Um, this is exciting for me. Some researchers believe that household cleaners that contain chlorine may, have, may be carcinogenic. Uh, pest control products may increase the risk of breast uh, cancer. Uh, so some of, the, some of the things we use to, to protect us from other pests may be carcinogenic. And we need to be very, very careful of what you're doing to yourself. Uh, the pest control people come around uh, Hogan housing all the time. I never let them in because I don't need that shit in my house. Thank you very much. Did I say shit? I meant that's what I meant. <laughs> Environmental toxins in the air, soil, and water contribute to an estimated 2% of fatal cancers. Bladder uh, cancer, lung cancer. Municipalities will treat their drinking water with chlorine to curb uh, cholera and typhoid fever outbreaks. Makes it taste like Clorox. Water that tastes like Clorox is not something you want to drink very much of. I was uh, running a half marathon in Indianapolis. And uh, <laughs> they were handing out water. And I grabbed one of them and, and you know, chug lugging this glass full of water. And I'm thinking, God, this tastes just like Clorox. It did. The, the water in Indianapolis is treated with so much chlorine that it tasted just like Clorox. I wouldn't get any more water. So I had a hard time finishing that, that uh, uh, half marathon because I couldn't drink the water. The water tasted like crap. Well, it tasted like Clorox. Yeah. Okay. If you like the flavor of Clorox, then by golly, go to Indianapolis and drink the damn water. It is bad. <clears throat> but that's Indianapolis. I'm sure all the other cities in the United States don't put Clorox in their, in their water. Uh, <laughs> cities will put fluoride, fluoride in their water to uh, combat tooth decay, as weird as that sounds. So sometimes you go and it tastes like uh, uh, Crest. If you, if you brush your teeth with Crest, you know that the after effect of the Crest makes your mouth taste really funny. That's what their water tastes like. It tastes like Crest toothpaste. Ew. <coughs> <laughs> this is something, time, you guys, I'm sorry. When's the last time you ran a marathon? Half marathon, uh, that was back in 2000, and, where was it? 2001. Oh, yeah. 2001. Yeah, 2001. We got to run around the Indianapolis 500. It's, it's a two-and-a-half-mile loop, so we started in the middle of, of Indianapolis. We ran to the, out to Speedway, which is where the Speedway is. <laughs> we ran around the track, and then we went back to, to where we started. Half marathon. It was great. Are you too old right now? Are you Am I too old to run? No, I've got too many muscle, or too many joint problems. Like my left knee, I don't have any, an ACL in my left knee. I, I try not to do it. This is a problem that only white people have. The paler you are, the worse it gets, as you can see. Uh, this young lady has, this is what she's supposed to look like. This is what her skin actually looks like. And of course, that's a sunburn. This guy's got a sunburn as well. <clears throat> I imagine it's really bad down here where it's so damn hot in the summertime, right? People get burned pretty bad. You guys don't have to worry about it. You just turn darker, right? No, you burn? You burn? Yeah. You fry too? Um, last time I was in Mexico. Last time I was in Mexico. Oh. Well, that's close, really close <laughs> to the heat right now. Okay. I, I don't. I try. You don't burn? No. Good. My kids don't burn. Like, also, like this past weekend, I was in Phoenix and I went swimming and tried. Tanning? Yeah, I tried. Oh, you don't tan? Or I just don't get dark. You don't turn any color at I all? Just, I'll just get like pink, but then that's it. And then I think, like, when I go back in, oh, maybe I got a little dark. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess we're the red and you have to peel it off. Oh, it's fun. Isn't it? it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. You just turn brown. You turn brown? Yeah. Like my kids do. You turn brown? Mm -hmm. Yeah, turn dark. Sure. Yeah, you're lucky. Uh, yeah, my kids have Italian ancestry. I get, they get it from their mother. They certainly don't get it from me. 
and they just turned brown. Uh, both my son was a, a surfer out in California for ten <coughs> years, never never burned at all. My daughter's the same way. She goes out and she just turns brown like a nut. Lucky them, huh? Me, I fry like a. I look like this lady right over here with her red belly. <laughs> 40 to 50 percent of Americans who reach uh, 65 develop skin cancer, primarily because they have unprotected uh, sunbathing. Uh, those of us who were hippies back in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, you know, we were we were sun worshippers. Uh, we think that that brown is prettier than than white. It is, it really is. Suntans are, are much more attractive. Uh, so these are the individuals that are actually developing skin cancer. And as I told you before, I played a lot of softball, so I, I get uh, skin cancer in places where uh, my, my face is exposed or my neck is exposed. Uh, so I've had three chunks of skin cancer cut off. Ultraviolet B rays damage DNA and cause 90% of the skin cancers. Many researchers believe that the frequency of sunburns in childhood may lead to skin cancer and even melanoma. And of course, melanoma is a deadly disease. It is a, a there you go, that's what melanoma looks like. Melanoma is a potentially deadly form of cancer that strikes the melanin-containing cells of the skin. Factors that may lead to an increase in melanoma. Uh, we've got a really serious problem, the thinning of the ozone layer protecting the earth from UV radiation. Uh, there is especially uh, a hole in the ozone around the two pole, poles, uh, around the uh, equator, it's thicker, uh, but around the poles it's almost not there at all. Increased sun tanning and the use of tanning booths, and of course this is, is always dangerous uh, for all individuals, uh, and that's what uh, melanoma actually looks like. Uh, so if you get a brown bump and it, and it seems to be growing, potentially you need to go see the doctor. He needs to take care of it before it turns into multiple myeloma, uh, which uh, is, a, is a melanoma that has metastasized, and you certainly don't want that to happen. In which case, uh, you've got melanin all over your body. All of your, well, your melanin, any melanin that you have in your body is susceptible to this uh, uh, cancer. And of course, then it kills you, and then you're dead. It kills you quick, too. Uh, multiple myeloma will kill you in a matter of months. So you have to be real careful of this. Those with the deepest tans are the least knowledgeable about skin cancer. They're more uh, relaxed. They are more sensitive to the influence of peers who value a good tan. And of course, if you go down to Florida and you wander around with all the rich people, they've all got really nice sun tans. Um, uh, Trump does this from time to time. You can always tell when he's been down to Mar-a-Lago Mar because he has raccoon eyes. Uh, he wears sunglasses and then he, the rest of his face turns orange, which is always attractive. Orange people are my favorite people. The Oompa Loompas, which is my favorite television show. Uh, they tend to take uh, other health risks, of course, besides tanning. Uh, they are more focused on their appearance than anything else. It's better to look good than to feel good. Immunocompetence is the overall ability of the immune system at any given time to defend the, the body against the harmful effects of foreign agents. Overall health, uh, the nature of uh, life-threatening disease or foreign agents, uh, perceived stress, all of these uh, have to do with your immunocompetence. The immune surveillance theory is the theory that cells of the immune system play a monitoring function in searching for and destroying abnormal cells. And we talk about this all the time. You've got cancers growing in your body all the time, and your immune system is wandering around knocking it out. As long as your immune system is strong, you don't have to worry about it. You guys don't have to worry about it because you're young. As you get older, your immune system uh, becomes uh, less, of, less efficient. And this is when people die. Uh, they die of, of uh, one thing or another. They come down with a disease or they, uh, uh, they form a cancer. Uh, the more stress you're under, the more likely that you will have that, this type of a reaction. Uh, I, I told you the si story of my sister, didn't I? My sister was a lawyer in Indiana. She, was, she wrote all these wonderful laws about stalking anti-stalking laws. She wrote uh, laws about spousal abuse and uh, child abuse. 
Uh, before that, uh, Indiana didn't have any of these laws, uh, but she's the one that wrote all the laws. This is back in the 70s. Uh, she's married to the most wonderful person in the whole wide world. <laughs> she grew up with three bro four brothers that she hated horribly. We were just horrible, horrible people because we were so loud and we were so damn masculine all the time. So she hated us because we made too much noise and she wanted to read. So my sister really didn't like us very much. So when she chose a husband, she chose somebody that was the polar opposite of her brother, of her brothers, me and my three brothers. And of course, we were always fighting and, and uh, doing all kinds of boy stuff. And she didn't like that. So she married a guy that was a little bit more sensitive than we were, a little bit more empathetic than we were. And he had a beard, and he was going bald. This is what men are supposed to do. Men are supposed to go bald, and they're supposed to grow beards. And so he was very, very masculine as far as she was concerned. Well, it turned out, <laughs> it turned out that he felt like a girl on the inside. This is one of the reasons why she liked him so much. She liked him, she thought he was so masculine people when they had sex. I guess that's what she thought they were. He was masculine. But um, <clears throat> He told her one day that he always felt like Vivian on the inside. Despite the fact he was in his 40s at the time, and he had already had a child. And he'd been married once before and had a child with this other individual. He didn't really feel like a boy. He felt like a girl. So he was transgender. So he felt like a girl on the inside, but he looked like a boy. That beard, balding head. Black hair, he had black hair. Um, so my sister got upset. You can imagine how much stress this put her under. You know, this perfect man that she'd been talking about for decades. Well, not decades. She'd only been married for about 12 years. She, uh, so she was, it was a very stressful time for her. Well, unfortunately, she developed. Because of the stress, her immune system became depleted. Uh, because her immune system became depleted, she started having heart problems. She developed a cancer in her uterus, in her uh, endometrium. She had had a hy hysterectomy earlier, and they had left some endometrial cells in there. And of course, they didn't have anything to do now, because, you know, endometrial cells are for your period. <laughs> and since they didn't have anything to do, they just developed into a cancer. And unfortunately, they, for some reason, they couldn't operate on it. It uh, metastasized in her liver, and eventually she died. Of course she died. But the whole point of my story is she became stressed out because of, she married Vivian instead of Bob. She thought she married Bob, but she actually married Vivian. <laughs> and she died of cancer because she became immunocompromised because of it. But it was really kind of curious, if you look back at her history, she developed her cardiomyopathy, her enlarged heart, uh, first, and then she developed the cancer. Or maybe they happened in, in tandem. Now the interesting thing was, once she had the cancer surgery done, her cardiomyopathy went away. It cured her cardiomyopathy. It didn't really, her, the reason she had cardiomyopathy was because of her cancer. So once they treated her cancer, her heart improved. They were, she was on a heart transplant once, I know, because of her enlarged heart. And then they realized, oh, she's got this cancer problem. Anyway, she's dead. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that she began to be compromised because her perfect husband turned out to be one of, who want, he wanted to be her sister. So her husband, I know, it's a tragic, tragic story. <laughs> And only I can laugh about it. You guys are going, oh my God, you're saying silly things about your dead sister. Yes, I'm saying silly things about my dead sister. <clears throat> my sister and I uh, used to argue all the time. I was her most despised brother. <clears throat> Why? <laughs> because I was the only one that would argue with her. All my other brothers would, if she said something, uh, instead of... Uh, arguing with her, they would just agree with everything she said. Bastards, stupid bastards. I mean, if she's wrong, she's wrong, right? Is that the way it works? 
right is right and wrong is wrong. Okay. So I would argue with her, and she didn't like that. So I, this is this is a sister. Uh, they were trying to keep her going. She was kind of a wimp all of her life. As sad as that is, she was a wimp all of her life. When she was in the womb, she hardly moved. My mother thought she was dead. She thought she was going to she was going to give birth to a stillborn baby because she never moved as a baby inside the womb. <clears throat> so she was real surprised when, when she was alive. <laughs> My mother was a nurse, so she knew all this stuff. Really kind of interesting. Anyway, so uh, she never moved throughout her life. She swore that uh, exercise was bad for you. And of course, you know, I'd run track and play softball and do all these things. She said, oh, all those muscles are just going to turn into fat. Well, just before she died, she admitted that I was right and she was wrong. It's the only time in her life that she ever admitted that she was wrong about something. It's kind of like Sheldon on Big Bang Theory. She never admitted she was wrong. Anyway, she, she died. Uh, the immune surveillance theory is a theory that cells of the immune system play a monitoring function in searching for and destroying abnormal cells. And my sister's situation is perfect. Uh, it proves that perfectly. The global immunosuppression model is an early uh, theory that proposed that stress always suppresses immune responses. And that's what happened with my sister. The more stress she was under, uh, the more likely she was going to develop uh, something physical, a problem. For the chronically stressed individual, this model purported that these individuals were more susceptible to infectious diseases and cancers. Um, this is a hint and a warning. Uh, you can tell your friends uh, it is finals time. Uh, you've got papers that are due. You've got all these discussions that are due. Uh, the probability that you will get sick, uh, not this week, not next week, uh, but right after finals is very, very high. And the reason is because you're because of stress. Uh, you're going to be under a lot of stress. You've got all this work to do. Uh, you're going to be you know, busting your tail trying to get all this work done, and that's the way it works, and that's fine, don't worry about it. Uh, you're going to get sick uh, the second, third week of May. Okay. That's when you're going to develop your cold, you're going to have, uh, what, I don't know, what, whatever diseases are wandering around, you're going to get sick. So just expect it, fight it off, uh, convince yourself that it's the stress that's causing your problems, and maybe you won't get sick. But just be aware that this may potentially happen. And if you're aware of it, then it won't happen. You'll do things to dissipate your stress. Otherwise, you'll allow the stress to build up. And then you'll get sick. Besides sickness, could it be a different effect, like uh, depression or some sort of... Depends on the effect besides... Sure. All of that stuff. And it's all caused by stress. So you're okay. I'm okay, you're okay. You may have, uh, and my wife hates me when I go home after, after you know, in May, because I'm like catatonic for three days. I just graded all your shit for one thing. I had to turn into all your grades. I had to decide whether I was going to flunk you if you were this close to a, a D, whether I was going to give you your D. It's very stressful. And my, yeah. So you know, I have to convince myself that my doing you a favor by passing you if you didn't actually deserve it. Pass. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. And my wife hates me because I'm so stressed out. And I feel guilty because, you know, I just thought Monique again for the 19th time. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> and I'm thinking, damn, her whole family's going to come after me when I get back on the reservation. Which is it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Do other instructors feel this way? Do other instructors feel this way? I have no idea. I'm, I'm real sensitive to this stuff. And this is one of the reasons why I, I let you guys turn in stuff on, you know, I, I give you all the time in the world to get, to get stuff done. Because I don't want to flunk. I don't, that's the last thing I want. I want you guys to get all your work done. I want you to get everything in. Because it hurts me, it bothers me when I have to give you a bad grade. Of course, if you haven't shown up all year, it doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> it's just, you know, 
if I haven't seen you and I can't remember what you look like, then probably it's not going to bother me nearly as much as if somebody that, that sits in the back of the room, Travis, uh, <laughs> you know, he's always there, so he's always looking at me with those big puppy dog eyes it is. <laughs> uh, anyway, yes, it bothers me. I... Do other instructors feel the same way? Most of them are the meanest sons of bitches in the world. I don't know if you noticed that, especially the people in the science department. Aren't, aren't they jerks? I'm taking a science course right now, so I can't say Okay. <laughs> Good for you. You get an A. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, for the chronically stressed individual, this model purported that these individuals are more susceptible to, uh, susceptible to infectious diseases and cancers. And of course, that was my sister. Uh, the love of her life decided to be a girl. Uh, and by the way, he has trans, what do they call it? Trans something. He has changed. He, he is a girl now, but he's the ugliest girl you so. He, I mean, he's got a man's chin. He had black. He had, transgender? He, well, he is transgender, transition. but he is trans. Transition. Transition, that's oh, it. Okay. Thank you. He, he has transition to be a girl, but remember, he's bald headed. Well, just the top part of this. And then he's got this horrible black beard. So, all the insurance money he got from my sister dying, he used for electrolysis to get his beard taken his black beard, which is always, men attract, women with beards are always attractive, mm -hmm. far more attractive than those of you who don't have beards. <laughs> anyway, and he wears a scarf over his head because he can't grow hair. He's got this really, really long hair, but right here he's got no hair at all. Mm -hmm. So he wears this scarf over his head. He wears uh, 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 sweater sets, sweater sets, where he's got a sweater underneath and a sweater that with just the top button button. He's had his shots, so he 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 titters. <laughs> I can't even do it. He, <laughs> he, he giggles. <laughs> it's so that he sounds like a girl because you know girls giggle. Don't girls giggle? Teenage girls giggle, but you know adult. He's in his sixties, so he's not the most attractive man in the world. Anyway, <clears throat> I, I'll stop talking about. It. People. Childhood adversity has been associated with greater emotional and physiological sensitivity to stress. And of course, the, the biggest problem was, for me, was the fact that I knew that he killed my sister. If he had taken a gun and shot, shot her, and she died five years later, that's exactly what happened. I know that that's what happened. But she was in the He said he did. But I know he did. And my dad died thinking that this man killed his sister his most beloved daughter. <clears throat> my dad only liked one of his kids, and that was my sister. She was the oldest. When he was in Germany, when he was in World War II, the only reason he survived was because of, you know, it didn't have anything to do with me. I, was, I came along in 1949. So my sister was born in 44, when my dad was overseas, and that, that kept him alive. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, more difficulty dealing with adulthood stress, what are we talking about? Childhood adversity has been associated with greater emotional and physiological sensitivity to stress. This is, if those of you who are, who are going to become counselors, you need to remember this because it is what happened to people in their childhood. It, it affects them today as adults. If something happened to them when they were five, they thought of that as a five-year-old. And they can only rationalize it as a five-year-old. Well, five-year-olds don't have a mature mind. So they can't really deal with this. So when you start dealing with people that something happened to them in their childhood, one of the things that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to talk about what happened to them in their childhood. And sometimes they have thought about this, but they've never really talked about it. They've thought about it like they, as, as if they were that five-year-old and they've rationalized it as if they were five years old. So sometimes dealing with this as an, as an adult, just talking about it 
as an adult, changes the way that they think about it. And now they're thinking about it and rationalizing it as an adult. And that takes care of the situation. It is less traumatic for them. When they were five years old, they couldn't understand why daddy was messing with <clears throat> It didn't make any sense, or Uncle Charlie. It didn't make any sense to them. And they couldn't rationalize it. This was the person that was supposed to be protecting them. As an adult, of course, you can think about this and understand Uncle Charlie had a problem. It was Uncle Charlie's fault. It wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything to deserve this. And because they can do this, because they will do this as an adult, it takes care of the problem. It dissipates the trauma of the situation. So that's one of the things that, you, that you're potentially going to have to do. If you're dealing with somebody that was sexually assaulted at, at five years old or three years old, I mean, what's the rationale of a three-year-old? But if you can think about this, if you can talk about this as a, as a 25-year-old, then you can actually understand and rationalize why this happened to you. And it makes more sense. Otherwise, it just keeps repeating on you. I don't understand. Nobody's going to protect me. I can't be protected. But you couldn't be protected when you were three years old. Now you can kick the shit out of that guy, I mean, if you want to. So if somebody tries to mess with you, you can just drill him a couple of times, and it's all over with. <clears throat> but now you can understand what happened to you. Okay, so that we, when we talk about childhood trauma, sometimes we need to take them back so that they can deal with it. Uh, the, 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 okay, uh, they're more sensitive to stress, they're, uh, more difficulty dealing with adulthood stress, more pronounced cortisol and autonomic or stress response, disrupted cellular immune function and immune system dysregulation. So because they, they haven't dealt with this, because they had to deal with this when they were three years old, that whole cortisol loop has been developed in these individuals. This is one of the things we discovered from Vietnam. With the individuals that uh, suffered from PTSD the worst were the individuals who had suffered a childhood trauma, whatever that trauma may happen to, to have been. Most of it, of course, we're dealing with males here, uh, not so much sexual trauma, but usually physical trauma. They were abused as children, and now, as 25-year-old soldiers, uh, they go into combat, and all of a sudden that cortisol loop, which was created when they were three years old, is more prevalent for these individuals. Those of us who never suffered any childhood traumas. We didn't have nearly as much trouble. <clears throat> I have a brother who, when he was two years old, he came down with rheumatic fever. I'm sorry, not when he was two, when he was in the second grade. I knew there was a two or something. When he was in the second grade. Because he, he went through a whole year where he went, wasn't able to go to school, that was very traumatic for him. When he went into combat, he was a combat engineer. Uh, when he went into combat, uh, he suffered from PTSD, and he still has PTSD to this day. The rest of us who went through, didn't go through rheumatic fever, my three brother, uh, my two brothers and me, uh, our PTSD isn't nearly as bad. Mine has to do with odors, which I told you guys about over and over again. That's why I can't eat mutton. I can't be around mutton. It's mutton. Mutton tastes like burned food. You understand that? If I ever leave, the reason is because I can't. There's too much mutton. Okay. Every time I walk past the <coughs> cafeteria, I almost said chavo. Every time I walk, uh, walk past the cafeteria, I smell mutton. And it takes me right back to that price thing. Not that price thing. I mean, there were numerous price things. I have a neighbor that cooks mutton every weekend. And so I, when I go out to run, I, it just hits me right in the It's like, hits you in the gut. You understand what I'm talking about, and you're taken right back to where you were before. This horror. My brother's, my brother's trauma is much, much worse than mine. I had no problem with PTSD until I came here. <clears throat> and the problem is the smell. And there's nothing I can do about it. This trauma has to do with a lot of other things. But my trauma has to do with smell. Ah, odors. Oh my god. <clears throat> so stop eating mutton. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so what's Sarah's favorite food? Mutton stew, of course. Of course it is. Signs are, are signals that, uh, that can be seen by others. Symptoms are signals that are felt or noticed by someone who has them. The signs and symptoms of cancer depend on uh, where the cancer is, its size, and whether it is, has metastasized. Having one or more of these symptoms uh, doesn't necessarily mean that, they have, that you have uh, cancer, but if a symptom has lasted for a long time or, or, or is getting worse, you should see a doctor. If you lose weight, a lot of weight all at one time, uh, you've got fever, of unknown origin, uh, unexplained fatigue, uh, you can't, yeah, you're tired all the time. You have pain and it, there's no reason for you to have pain. If your skin becomes uh, discolored, if it turns yellow or red, or it just turns dark, we got a problem. Uh, potentially, um, if your skin turns yellow, that means you've got something going on in your liver. And this is not good. Your liver is, is, the reason it's called your liver is because you can't live without it. So, and we can't transplant livers now, but you need your liver. And if, uh, if, you're, if your skin turns yellow, it means that you've got something going on in your liver. Pain or other uh, changes in your bladder or bowel habits. You know, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of classes ago. You need to be aware of what your stool looks like. You need to be aware of what your urine looks like. You need to be aware of what your stool smells like. I know that sounds grotesque. You need to know what your urine smells like. If it starts stinking, smells bad, now you, there's potentially you've got a urinary tract infection or you've got, a, you've got uh, cancer of the, of the bladder. These are all things that you need to be aware of. Um, a lot of times when people uh, develop cancer, they ignore the symptoms. They ignore the signs. They ignore the fact that, uh, that they're, they're slowly dying and they don't even know it. Uh, we had a guy that came in one time, is this old fart, he used to wear a suit. So he came into the emergency room with a suit, he had his tie on, he's like in his 60s. Uh, he was uh, on warfarin, he was on uh, uh, anticoagulant. Uh, and this individual came in and he, was, he looked like that board right there. He was a white guy, but I mean he was pale as literally pale as death. And of course, he came in and his wife had been telling him he, he looked kind of pale. And he was ignoring her, of course. And we looked at him and you can tell if somebody's anemic, you can look at their, the beds of their fingernails, you can look at their gums. And this guy had, his fingernails were white. You didn't even have to squeeze them. His fingernails were just white. As white as that page right there. And you look at his gums and they're white. Yeah. And so we knew that the guy was a so we drew his blood and, and it turned out that uh, he's supposed to have a 48 hematocrit and he had a, a 22. He had a 22. So we started talking to him and we asked him about all of the problems that he could potentially have. Did he notice, had he noticed any blood in the world? Had he noticed any blood in the world? Hadn't been bleeding, had, didn't have any bruises, didn't have any pain in his, in his abdomen. Uh, what had happened was that he was bleeding into his colon, his bleed, and his stool had turned black. And it had turned black and then it turned white. Uh, it had turned black because he was digesting some of the blood that was leaking into his, into his small intestines. And then it turned white because it didn't have time to, to get rid of it, so his, his stool was black. So he had, for, for weeks he'd been you know, either black or white stools. This isn't normal. You're not supposed to have black or white stools. Your stool is supposed to be somewhere in the green to brown range. But he didn't, he was too... <laughs> there was something about this guy, he never looked at his damn stool. So he just flushed it down the toilet without looking at it. So he didn't know it was black. He didn't know it was white. And of course the doctor, we got a stool specimen from me, and it was white. And we're going, you know, this is almost pure blood. It was, and he'd almost, he almost bled himself to it. Because he didn't look at his stool. The dumb shit. <clears throat> so you need to do this. If you've got blood in your stool, this is a problem. If you've got a black stool, this is a problem. If you've got white stool, that means you're bleeding into your colon, and we've got really got a big problem. 
So you need to look at all this stuff. You need to watch yourself. You need to see what is coming out of your body. If you've got, uh, if you've got pus coming out of any place, that means you've got an infection. This, you need to know this. Anyway, he almost died. We saved his life, of course. We wanted to let the old fart die, but of course, we're not allowed to do that. You know, we're a military hospital. I'm just kidding. We didn't want anybody to die. <laughs> we didn't want the old fart to die. He was a retired Air Force colonel. Had flown combat missions during World War II. He's a fighter pilot. Flew thunderbolts. Bastard. <clears throat> And he didn't want to look at his stool. Um, if, so if you've got pain anywhere, you need to be aware of all this stuff. Sores that won't heal. I know traditionally you're not supposed to look at this kind of stuff. Don't worry about it. Just do it for me, okay? So that you don't die anytime soon. Anytime without knowing that you're sick. Sores that won't heal. White spots on your tongue or inside your mouth. Especially if you chew tobacco or you dip snuff or you smoke uh, marijuana or, or tobacco, uh, you need to be careful uh, of what's going on in your mouth. This is mucous membrane, it's very delicate tissue. Uh, the, uh, if, especially if you dip snuff, uh, snuff has um, fiberglass in it. And fiberglass cuts your, your gums. And because it cuts your gums, of course, it, it opens you up to all kinds of interesting problems. So you need to be, be aware of what's going on in your mouth. Uh, unusual bleeding, and no matter where it is, uh, if, you're, uh, if, if your uh, period is prolonged, if you're female, of course, if you're male, you don't have periods. Uh, Travis, the... <laughs> trying to wake him up back there. <laughs> anyway, so if you're bleeding excessively, no matter where you're bleeding from, uh, that's not good, it's never any good. Uh, usual bleeding, but okay. Uh, any lumps in your breasts or other parts of your body, uh, you need to be aware of what you feel like. Uh, if you've got, you know, you got a lump in your pec, on your pec, this is not a good thing. I got a lump right under my tricep muscle. It's a fatty lipoma is what it is. But, I mean, it could be something bad. So I need to be aware of all of these lumps and bumps. Even in your sexual parts, you're not even supposed to know about. You need to check your, if you're male, you need to check your testicles, make sure you don't have any lumps on your testicles. If you're female, you need to check, uh, check your labia. Uh, you need to check your breast tissue to make sure there's no lumps in there. That could be fibroid tissue, or it could be cancer. And you need to make sure that this is not something that's going to hurt you. In, in, indigestion or difficulty swallowing. Uh, when I had my heart attack, I felt like I had indigestion. I felt like I had acid reflux. But it was continuous. I couldn't make it go away. Um, and so you need to be aware of all of these things. If it's indigestion, it may mean that you've got an ulcer. It could be a heart attack. It could be cancer of the stomach. Especially if you're Asian. Asians get stomach cancer all the time. Asians swallow their stress. They swallow their stress. Uh, and what I'm talking about is when they smoke cigarettes, they, swallow, they, they take the, the uh, smoke and they swallow it down into their stomach. Uh, when they drink alcohol, they, it stays in their stomach for an extended length of time because they don't have as much alcohol dehydrogenase. Uh, so they, they swallow their, their uh, stress. And they, they have stomach cancer at a far higher rate than as bizarre as I may seem. <clears throat> so indigestion, uh, be careful of that. Any noticeable, noticeable changes in a wart or a mole? We've all got moles all over the place. Uh, we've got warts, Some of, sometimes we'll have warts. If these things change, if they get bigger, if they change color, then you need to go see the doctor and, uh, and uh, it could potentially be skin cancer. Could be melanoma, you gotta be really careful, careful especially of moles. Uh, you think it's a mole, it turns out to be melanoma. So you've got to be really careful of, your, of all these brown spots you've got all over your body, if you've got brown spots on your body. Persistent cough, that, that won't go away. Uh, early detection can dramatically improve a person's chances of survival. 
Detecting breast and testicular cancer can be done with breast testicular self-examination. Uh, or you can let somebody else do it if you want, uh, but uh, uh, just do it. No matter who's doing it, it doesn't really ma make any difference. Of course, if you do it, you know what it feels like. The other person just knows, well, they know what it feels like. Well, anyway. They don't know if it hurts or not. Yeah, they're fondling. <laughs> they're, they're just having a good time. Self-examination is a source of detection of a majority of, of uh, tumors in these organs. Uh, clinical breast exam should be done every three years for women uh, between 20 and 40 and annually after age 40. Uh, so, and you need to do it yourself so, because you know what your breasts are supposed to feel like. You know if it hurts or not. 30 to 50% of people who develop cancer wait three to four months before seeking medical attention. And usually it's because of the grief process. They're in denial. They're in denial and they won't admit it until somebody tells them that that's what it is. So they wait and they wait too long uh, to, to have surgery. They've waited three to four months and now all of a sudden it's metastasized. Surgery ain't gonna do no good. So now they're SOL. And the L stands for luck, of course. So go in. Go in right away. Women are much better at this than men. It's one of the reasons why men die of cancer more readily than women do. It's because when a woman comes down with something, she knows it's not right. She goes in to see the doctor. Men try to pretend it's something else. It's anything else. They don't want, to, they don't want anybody fondling their testicles. I don't, you know, men are just so goofy anyway. They don't want somebody sticking their finger up there. Do men go through uh, mammograms? Um, no, they, it doesn't work on men. There's not enough tissue to <coughs> smash. So is it more like ultrasound? Uh, yeah, that's what they usually do. But men have breast cancer. It's not very common. It does happen. Uh, you know why? Um, men usually don't grow breast tissue like that, uh, but if they smoke pot, uh, a lot of times they get fatty lipomas behind their nipples, uh, so their nipples are pooch out. Uh, that's, it's that tissue that turns into breast cancer, as bizarre as that sounds. I hate to pick on marijuana again, but hey, it causes breast cancer in men. <clears throat> which is kind of funny if you watch movies from the 1980s or 1990s you'll see sometimes you'll see guys with with, with nipples that stick out and you're going what the hell's going on they're, they're pot smokers and it causes fatty white homes. Uh it'll do the same thing in women but of course in women you don't because their nipples are larger anyway okay all this medical stuff, geez, should we even be talking about that? For people uh, with a family history of cancer, genetic screening can assist in early detection. This gives the individual the option to have preemptive surgery to remove the organ that is susceptible to cancer. But this also raises ethical issues. Armed with the knowledge, should a responsible physician treat a child or even a young adult as if the problem is inevitable? And of course, this is what happened with Angelina Jolie. I'm, I'm going to show you a picture of all the people that died young in her family. And she's approaching 50. So she has a lot of people that died in their 50s and 60s. Um, so you've got, you got a piece of information. You know that you have a genetic proclivity for a select problem. So do you just have that organ cut out? In, in her case, it was, her, it was breast cancer. Let me show you her family right there. These are all the people that died of, uh, of cancers. This is her uncle. He died of prostate cancer in his 50s. Uh, this is her mom. She died of ovarian cancer at 56. Uh, this is her aunt. She died of breast cancer at 61. This is her grandfather. He died of sweat gland cancer at 61. Uh, this is her great aunt. She died of, uh, she had a double mastectomy. She had breast cancer. Uh, she died in her 70s. This is her second cousin. She died of breast cancer in her 40s. So as you can see, the females in her family have a proclivity for breast cancer. And they die young. Very, very young. So what Angelina Jolie did, noting that she had the same genes that all these individuals had, she had, she had, her, she had a double mastectomy. 
She also had a hysterectomy. Remember, her mother died of ovarian cancer at 56. So Angelina Jolie doesn't have any more reproductive parts. They're all gone because her family has a proclivity for uh, cancer in those parts. She had twins. I think they were artificially inseminated, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, she had twins. She had them in Paris, of course. She wouldn't want to have them in the United States. Anyway, she's got six kids now. Four of them are, are adopted, adopt, adopted kids, and then she has the two twins. But now she doesn't have any body parts. I mean, any reproductive parts. Her breasts are gone. Her her ovaries are gone. Her uterus is gone. She's had a hysterectomy. She's on estrogen replacement therapy, I think, but she may not be, because if you increase the estrogen level you're more likely to develop uh, one of uh, a cancer, some kind of, some form of cancer. What happens to the body, like say hysterectomy, um, does the, the body intestines kind of fall into that area? No. no, no, it just fills up. So we're okay. I haven't seen her in anything since she had her double mastectomy. Um, she had it right after that movie about the pull well, ups. Yeah. Maybe it was after the second one she had the double mastectomy. Double mastectomy. Oh, it hasn't come out? <laughs> What's wrong with you, Chris? <laughs> Diagnostic surgery is surgery to obtain a tissue sample that can be tested for cancer. This is known as a biopsy. My son's fiance has basal cell carcinoma. It's the size of a dime. And I, I'd show you what a dime looks like, but somebody took all my change. And it's on her forehead, right under her hairline. Yeah, about that big. And uh, she's, got, she's going to have surgery next Wednesday. Uh, what they're going, and it's five to six hour surgery. It's a basal cell carcinoma, which is skin cancer. It's all it is, is skin cancer. But they're gonna shave it off. And every time they shave a layer, they're going to take it into the lab and they're going to inspect it for cancerous cells. So they're, they're going to shave it down until they come to healthy cells. And that's usually what they do when they do surgery. They try to cut out all of the cancerous growth. Uh, when they, they, they did that, that with my sister. Uh, when they went in and gave her her hysterectomy, they just pulled everything out of the They cut everything out. They cut out her uterus and they cut out her ovaries. But unfortunately, they left some endometrial tissue. So. That she developed into the and then, of course, the rest of its history. Uh, but uh, so normally, th th this th these biopsies. Uh, my second wife had uh, lumps in her breasts, uh, and they had to go in and do a, uh, a needle biopsy. Where they stuck it into the uh, the uh, lump, and they drew up some fluid to find out if there were, what kind of cancer cells. Sorry. They're looking for the key. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've, I've been in on those. Not the, not the guy sticking, but the guy has the slide. Who's the slide? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, when I worked in, at Children's Hospital, uh, we were. We were the only children's hospital within like 500 miles, um, so we got it was in Omaha. So we got all the kids from South Dakota, uh, we got all the kids from Kansas, and all the kids from Nebraska, and all the guys from Western Western Ohio. And uh, we had a lot of three-year-old patients. And back then, of course, we didn't have the same treatments we had, so a lot of them didn't make it. But we did a lot of biopsies, but they were on kids. You know, 
Preventive surgery is used to remove a benign growth that might uh, become malignant, as in the case of Angelina Jolie. Preventive, uh, preventive uh, surgery can be used to remove organs that genetics indicate might easily become cancerous in the future. And that's what she had done. Uh, she had to have it done in, in France because we wouldn't do it in the United States. We don't take out healthy tissue. We don't cut out healthy tissue for no reason, except unless it's for, um, unless we want them to look prettier. That's, that's the only reason we'll cut off healthy tissue. Uh, staging surgery is used to determine the extent of, di of disease. Uh, laparoscopy uh, can be done to gauge the degree of malignant growth and to take tissue samples. Uh, laparoscopy is what I had uh, done when uh, I ruptured my spleen. Uh, they just chopped me open, opened me up, and made sure, tried to figure out what was going on. And so I'm opened up from my sternum all the way down to my kidney, all the way down to here. Uh, well, they went around my rib cage, so it's, yeah, it's a lot than it needs to be. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a question mark, yeah. <laughs> it's got a dot down there. Uh, laparoscopy. Uh, curative uh, surgery involves the removal of the tumor, of course. Restorative surgery is used to reconstruct a person's appearance or the function of an organ or body part. And like I said, I haven't seen her since she had her double mastectomy done. I imagine they've, they've given her breast implants. Uh, normally they do, at, at this stage they do. For the longest time they couldn't do that though, unfortunately. Uh, cancer surgery is associated with higher levels of distress and slower rates of emotional <coughs> recovery than other surgeries. 60% of cancer patients will have some form of surgery. And that, of course, with leukemia there's nothing to surge, there's nothing to cut out. Uh, but with other cancers, there is. Uh, my sister had uh, uh, surgery on her, or her uterus, which was cancerous. She'd always had a fibroid uterus. She wasn't able to produce children, to reproduce, because her, her uterus was too stiff. It would, that didn't expand. Uh, it was fibroid. So she was never able to have children. Uh, and then the fibroids turned into uh, uh, cancers. And so they went in and took the whole thing out, took everything out, except those endometrial cells that they left behind. Chemotherapy is when uh, medicines are used to treat the cancer. Chemotherapy can destroy cancer cells that have metastasized. Uh, one of the biggest problems with metastasized uh, cancers is that um, the immune system isn't working on them anymore. The immune system, they have masked themselves against uh, your own immune system. So you can't use somebody's immune system. To, to fight the cancer. However, they have a new technique where they inject the cancer with, uh, uh, with some kind of a marker, and then the immune system attacks it. It's really kind of fascinating. We, we, we weren't sure we could do this kind of stuff, and we were afraid that if we, if we uh, injected this marker in there to, to get the immune system to attack, that they would have all kinds of autoimmune diseases break out with this select individual. But we've been able to uh, inject them with, with these markers and now we can knock them out. These toxic drugs are uh, systematic drugs that travel through the bloodstream to reach cancers in other parts of the body. Chemotherapy can be used to cure cancer, to keep the cancer from spreading, to slow the cancer's growth, to kill cancer that has spread to other parts of the body, to relieve symptoms caused by the cancer. And of course, uh, when you're on chemotherapy, uh, usually you lose your hair, which is always attractive. So the cool things about these uh, kids with leukemia, if you think any of this is cool, they always lost their hair. And when it grew back after they recovered from their leukemia, uh, their hair was always a different color. It was all, it was, yeah, it's so cool. Your, yours is a different color. Oh, you did. Yeah. So you didn't have any white hair? I didn't have white hair before, but it came out. And then my hair, the texture, it's wiry. So oh. My hair is like, my husband laughs because he said it's like an Asian's hair. He's like, your hair is like those Japanese ladies. So how many Japanese ladies don't even know that? No, you don't used to see them, you know. So, so he used to laugh about it. He laughs about it. But um, 
when your hair comes out, when it starts falling out. I don't know if any other cancer patients have thought of it. It's like your hair itches, like your scalp. It, it tingles, it tingles, and then all of a sudden it's like, you run your hair through it, and then your hands through it, and it's like this hair starts falling out. You're like, what the hell? You sit there, and you can sit there for days and really rub your hand. Kind of like picking your nose, black. except for picking your head. Yeah, you're picking your head. So <laughs> it itches. It itches. Yeah, it's got that tingly feeling. Yeah, and, and then all the all oh, of it goes away. Oh, it's ugly. Yeah, I it used to bother me, so I used to constantly scratch my head. So he thinks your hair is like a Japanese person. Yeah, because it's like wiry, and that's how their hair is. To I think the texture. I think natives have thicker hair than other people anyway. Mine is thin. So when the little babies, their hair just grows straight out, and they look like, I don't know, bristle pads or something. Native American hair is different than any other. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I agree. And a lot of um, hairstylists, like white people, they don't know how to handle Native American hair. No, no, yeah, because your hair is thicker, yeah. and it's straight. And it's straight, they don't exactly. know how to. My hair's really long, like angel hair. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why men, uh, especially up north, they, they, they grow the braids, because they can. You know, if I tried to grow braids, it would, I'd look stupid. Okay, I'd look stupid. Okay. Yeah, Willie exactly. Nelson. Stick straight up. <laughs> Pigtails. Okay. Willie Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> He's so attractive. <laughs> Aminotherapy is a type of chemotherapy where the person's own immune system is enhanced to selectively target the cancer cells. I was going to say Japanese babies look like, like native babies because their hair grows straight up. Just, I mean, it's, and I, they're so cute. I think they're just cute as anything, but, but their hair grows straight out. And then all of a sudden, it lays down. So when they get like two years old, you can start combing their hair. Anti-cancer drugs are made uh, to kill fast-growing cells, uh, but this can also affect fast-growing cells in the body, like your blood cells, so they can give you anemia with chemotherapy. Uh, cells in the digestive tract, so that you have, start having uh, real serious problems with your, with your vomiting, with vomiting, because your, the cells in your digestive tract are sloughing off and they're dying. Cells in the reproductive system, uh, so becoming pregnant during uh, chemotherapy is uh, nigh on to impossible. Uh, hair follicles, so all your hair follicles, uh, all your hair falls out, which is okay because now you don't have to shave your legs, but, uh, well, you know, <laughs> your eyebrows fall out, which is always attractive. <clears throat> Side effects, nausea and vomiting, of course, hair loss, fatigue, uh, mouth sores, bleeding, infection, anemia, all of these are problems. My sister really suffered from anemia, uh, so she'd have to take uh, erythropoietin uh, in order to, uh, to give her more uh, energy. Uh, sometimes she would have to have blood transfusions uh, just to give her more energy. Uh, she didn't, wasn't hungry because she was nauseous, uh, so we would have to force her to eat, you know, pin her down. Yeah. Anticipation of side effects are sometimes worse than the side effects themselves. You think it's going to hurt, so it does hurt. Uh, and of course, that wasn't her problem. She's fairly ignorant about medicine, so she didn't have any clue what was going to happen to her. This smart lady that I could never tell anything to until she finally died, then she finally admitted I was right about something. Radiation is used to kill or damage fast-growing cancer cells with x-rays, gamma rays, alpha particles, and beta particles. Radiation usually knocks off cancer, but normally cells that are affected tend to grow back, uh, the cells that you kill with radiation. However, I had a friend with a brain tumor, right in the middle of his brain, and they decided they were going to use radiation. Well, they missed the tumor, whoops, and they hit his hypothalamus, and they killed his hypothalamus. So this guy's got to take a handful of pills every day to replace what his hypothalamus unfortunately. He also has a hole in the top of his head where they gave him his radiation therapy. 
Uh, they couldn't close it off because they were afraid that it would become infected. Uh, he had this when he was 14. When I knew him, he was in his 30s, and he still had that hole. It was weird. So chemotherapy is just basically hooked up to an IV? Yeah. They get you with all these really heavy chemicals. All these toxins. How long do you have to sit those chemicals? I don't know. How long do you have to sit those chemicals? I used to. So that's all it day. It just depended on how slow the chemo has gone. Sometimes um, on top of the chemo, you would also lose other nutrients in your body. Like for me, it was potassium, yeah. which means my potassium, I also had to get potassium. And that one is, that would take like almost six hours just for a big old bag of potassium and then sit there all day with your arm like this. And that potassium just barely dropped. Yeah. Like every three seconds it would drop. Yeah. And that's sucks. Yeah. 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 You can't make it go any faster because you'll gross yeah. the, yeah, the blood vessels. Yeah. You'll destroy the blood vessels. Yeah. And um, it just, the way I, I Describe it when chemotherapy, the, the medication came into my system, it used to just knock me out. You know, it's like straight poison went right into your body. Yeah, so literally, it's poison. It's poison. So when it came in, I said, I don't know if this is what heroin addicts feel, because when it went in, it's just like it just drains everything out of you automatically. It's just, I said, it felt like syrup going into my, into my system. Just the feeling of it. Yeah. So, so, so the answer is yes. It yeah, does feel so like it just like it, just, it feels like here. Because for me, like when it went in, as soon as it, because I used to have a port on my hair, pick line, and then I also had a port when my pick line got infected, and that was my fault. I wasn't supposed to leave the area, but I was homesick, so I came home. Dummy. Yeah, I didn't listen to the doctor, so I came home. <laughs> I missed everybody, so I came back from Tucson, came up here. And I went down to my dad's horse, touched my dad's horse, and I went back down. And I got really, really, really sick. And so... You're the, lucky you didn't die. Yeah, and so the doctor checked everything with my pig line, and then he came back and he was like, did you go home? And I was like, no. <laughs> and he was like, no. He was like, we found horse manure bacteria inside. So he said that's what got you sick. So they took it out, hit me with hit me up with really, really strong medication again. And then this time they put my pink line in on this side. So that one came back out this way, that line came through this way. So that's why I have like everyone who's having a right here. It's not any need. It's a it's a scar. It's a scar of a line. Because I went over my You know that dust that, that's flying around in, in the horse in the horse corral? It's manure. It's powdered manure. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just trying to help. So every everywhere I went, everyone I had to go. Mm, it tastes great. Because uh, your immune system is shot. Mm -hmm. Well, Exactly, exactly. And, and you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. So, who's that nutrients? That's why I'm like, yeah. Tough as nails. To survive, survive the, just the chemotherapy, you have to be tough as nails. And on top of that, um, I didn't know I was pregnant. Oh. So, when I was pregnant, I went through chemotherapy and radiation seven months and when we found out I mean I, I was skinny I was thin I was pale I had a new face and everything and 
I didn't know that I was pregnant because I just had a tiny bump on my stomach. And we all thought it was a side effect of one of my chemo was on the medications that I was taking. And the doctor would come in and he would press on my stomach trying to get rid of this bump. Oh, no. And then uh, they started giving me all sorts of medication to get rid of this bump, which was pretty much called like stool softeners and whatnot. So I was downing all these pills, doing whatever, and um, he finally brought in a female nurse practitioner. So she was like, I think you're pregnant. And I was like, the doctor interviewed right there, and he was like, no, she cannot be pregnant with the chemotherapy that we're giving her, hitting her with the radiation. There's no way her reproduction is even operating right now. You didn't get so, pregnant during? We don't know. Sure you do. <laughs> what you do? <laughs> you divide, you subtract by nine, okay? <laughs> so we don't know. We, we know exactly when we know exactly when you started your chemotherapy, and we know um, when you gave birth, yeah. and we know how long you're in chemotherapy. Yeah. So just there's got to be a nine in there. So there's a nine in there somewhere. So you, <laughs> you were pregnant before you got mm -hmm. probably. But they stopped my. My, um, once they found out, I was seven months pregnant when they, when they found out. They sent me in and they were like, okay, you're going to have to get an ultrasound. So they sent me over and I had, we were expecting this little, little tiny little thing. And said it was full blown. She was, she was already, she was already big enough to Oh, oh. Yeah. So basically, off of the measurements of her head and you know, the measurements of the ultrasound, that's when they kind of guessed she was seven months. Yeah, so, so she was born uh, two months later and she was healthy at the time. It wasn't until she was five years old, or when she was about the age where she's supposed to, her speech is supposed to develop, that I noticed that she wasn't speaking. Talking to my family about it, I looked at her mouth. The uvula in the back of your throat that sticks out, it was kind of like, like this, you know, it's just two of them. And I thought that was a normal, so I kept, I kept bringing it up to my husband and his family, my family, and they're like, oh, mother, she'll go into it, she'll develop, you know. But it wasn't until she was about five or six years old that we finally found out she had. Her mouth was closed, everything was closed, but it was up behind the palate, between and you couldn't the see. palate and the nose. So I guess uh, when she went through her first surgery, um, they corrected that uvula, but when they cut open her, uh, her palate, nothing was there. So the doctor ended up sure. fixing her up. Yeah, so you can reconstruct it. Poison. Yeah, it's poison. It's nasty stuff. That is correct.